back to deep thoughts ladies and gentlemen today i thought i would revisit a subject matter that we talk about with a particular angle on it hopefully i can go an hour on this one this has to do with sort of what i have seen my entire life and i know you've seen it too which is sort of the cyclical ufo fascination and i just want to dialogue for about an hour on the notion that maybe there's a reason why it's cyclical what do I mean by cyclical? There are there are two sides to the UFO phenomenon, right? The unidentified flying object phenomenon. And it has to do with, in my opinion, you know, real world observations of these things. Okay. And again, it doesn't have to doesn't have to prove itself as being an extraterrestrial object. Although that's where we would say anything that has intelligence is flying in the sky. Would have to be either a man-made object or a non-man-made object. Meaning anything else other than human we would classify as an extraterrestrial. And again, extra is supposed to call out to a non-Earth-based being. But I would split the here and simply say whoever or whomever might be driving these things in our world such that we can see them would essentially be extra outside of our realm of perception. So it doesn't matter if they're from Alpha Centauri or if they're just simply, you know, unobservable by us for whatever frequency reason or what have you, right? And it is, it, it appears to be, okay? And we're going to go through some of the subdermal things that we all talk about from time to time, but it would seem that the the average citizen seeing UFOs fuels any response from government or military investigations or reports or responses to this. It never um, it never happens, at least to my knowledge, it doesn't really happen from the military to the people. Now, I'm splitting a hair there again, which is that, you know, Yes, there have been sightings over military installations during um, ICBM tests that then get documented and released, and we get to see what the military saw because military is chasing one in the sky, what have you. But it really stems from an average citizen who happens to be a soldier. I don't mean to say average, but you know what I'm saying. We're not, you know, you know we don't have like supernatural human beings on this planet, but just a a pilot a person in the Navy seeing this, a soldier that's doing a night watch sees them, and then someone translates and transmits that observation into the apparatus of military, and then actions are taking place, right? Now, sometimes with the sky ones, uh, the only way that we can see them is through a radar blip, and then someone makes a phone call and goes, scramble and go find these things. Okay, you get my point. On the other side of it, you have organizations that can make a lot of money talking about it. I'm talking about it, right? I haven't, uh, I'm trying to think if I ever have seen one. I, you know, I'll share the only one I've seen, uh, sorry. The only thing I've seen that looked sort of unexplained, but it could definitely be man-made. But place like uh, channels on TV, History Channel, Discovery, Sci-Fi Channel, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Plenty of YouTubers make great videos about this. And I mean, I what's, what's fascinating, and I know that you guys know this, is that the average video documentary made by someone in their living room, cutting and pasting a bunch of stuff together, is so much more exciting and informative and thought-provoking than anything you see on cable television. Cable television, you know the formula. They, they exacerbate up uh, every emotional arc that's ridiculous that doesn't really exist so they can cut to commercial so you won't have to stay you have to stay till after the commercial to find out it was a complete letdown 
And that's really the reality show formula, right? But it does seem to come in cycles. And I'm wondering if there's any correlation between the state of society and these observations. I'm going to give you a few examples. When the Air Force started to exist in America, and we got out of biplanes and and zeppelins and that kind of stuff, and started getting to jet-powered, turbine-powered vehicles, then we know that there's only, especially without the Internet being available, there were a lot of citizens of the world, especially in America, I'll stick to America, that saw things in the sky that, hey, you know, did Farmer John who didn't watch much television because uh, they didn't exist or, or, you know, he doesn't listen to the radio, he doesn't read books because he's working so damn hard. And he sees some covert or even above-ground vehicle fly over his farm and he's sitting there one day, he's looking at it, and he doesn't know what it is. And so he crafts a story to say he's, it's a true story. He saw something he didn't recognize and there you get a tiny little story. So part of it could come out of the evolution of the technology. Then there are people like my grandmother in uh, roughly about 1920 seeing these cigar-shaped objects in the sky with a smoke trail at the back. All right. This is a woman that never told a tale, meaning a story that was embellished. She didn't tell ghost stories. She didn't tell anything. She, She lived, she's a meat and potatoes depression child who just thought that the now is the only time you need to really worry about and and she sat down with me in one of our last sessions in her early 80s and we're looking through a lot of photographs and what's funny was I didn't say hey grandma have you ever seen a UFO no for some reason she told me and then she had this reserve look on her face like yikes don't think I'm crazy and at the time I didn't dig in as deep as I could because I wasn't the deep thinker that I am today. I'm glad I can remember that and remember it so well. I remember exactly what sofa we were sitting on, what house we were in, what she was wearing, or how her face looked. I mean, thank God I've got that memory pretty locked in my my, uh, recollection. And then we have sort of oddities like the 1947 Roswell crash, where you do have a farmer who saw something crash, You have an archaeology teacher with his four or five students that saw it crash, and everybody was trekking to it uh, the next morning when the storm cleared. And, of course, the farmer is finding all the debris, finds the the disc-like object. Then he goes and reports it to the authorities, which then scrambles the Air Force. But in the time that between him telling the Air Force and someone coming to see it, you have a group of folks that found it that had no idea that it was there. They didn't see anything the night before. And then they bump into the archaeologist who brings his students in because they said, we thought it was a plane that crashed. And again, there was a downed aircraft about a week earlier. And so one of the rumors is is that they were seeing um, this craft and that the charred bodies were, uh, the little teeny tiny four-foot bodies that were charred were actually somehow, you know, I don't know, zombified pilots that just shrunk in size because they were outside. And we know from, obviously, empirical evidence from plenty of other horrific situations that the human body does not just shrink in a week because it's outside. We find bones all the time, and the bones aren't smaller, right? We find bones underneath, um, uh, you know, construction projects in London that have been there for centuries that didn't get any smaller, right? It's not like Beetlejuice with his little shrunken head thing, right? But there seems to be this pattern that I can't quite decipher, but there are, there are some elements to it, right? After Roswell, you had this sort of pop culture explosion in the notion of seeing UFOs. And it, it bled into Hollywood. Now, some of you might agree with me that that could have been a disinfo psyop to fictionalize UFOs, because you have to remember, there was Buck Rogers on TV, or I guess in the movies, excuse me, back in the 30s. And so you had 
Hollywood productions of aliens having these incredible sagas. Just read H.G. Wells, the guy, you know, the idea of aliens, and there's plenty of stories in the 1800s. You've seen tons of them where people um, go to far off planets and experience things. There's the old, what is it? Uh, one of the first movies ever made was the one about going to the moon in a little rocket, which just happened to turn into exactly how the Apollo mission was conceived nearly 70 years later. We had the day the earth stood still. We had all these B movies. We had, um, you know, Forbidden Planet, which I just mentioned recently. And then it was just sort of on. You know, once it happened, you had even Ed Wood, the famous Ed Wood, creating these little B movies. And we had a blast with those narratives, you know. And so whether or not they were real or not sort of got lost in the mishmash of the entertainment factor of, well, let's just write stories about this. In the 60s, we got Star Trek as a real deep exploration and what it would mean for mankind to explore uh, the near reaches of our particular galaxy. That makes a huge difference because it, then it starts informing us on uh, narratives that man has potentially created out of thin air. You know, Gene Roddenberry did a fabulous job thinking this stuff through. And then, of course, he got a reprisal in the 70s with the movie series starting and then he rebooted uh, Star Trek and Next Generations, right? But it will go to a point where during a 9-11 decade, you really have society focusing away from the phenomenon of UFOs. Now, there's always a sighting. There's always someone filming something or claiming to have found something. So it's not an absolute gag on the observations. It's just that when you have something else to focus on, you typically focus on it, right? So the question immediately, immediately presents itself like the following. Is it, is it like, I guess the word I want to say is like, is it a mainstay thing of our reality that these things exist and that we simply get distracted away from them? Or are they a construct of our imagination and hopes? Like I said in my uh, season one episode, The Alien Promise, whereby we want to be saved by aliens. And so when society gets more intense, we tend to lean towards these rescue formulas. Now, I just said, in my recollection, the amount of UFO uh, observations during, say, the 9-11 the crisis, it definitely took a hiatus. And again, that has no factor. And it wasn't like Sci-Fi Channel stopped airing UFO specials during those times. It's just your average internet buzz on, you know, some new uh, Mexico City observation or Area 51 stuff, it just seemed to kind of subside. And I could be wrong, technically speaking, in, in the reality of, of tracked sightings. In this time right now, like I've said in some episodes, and I've kind of uh, organically, without really trying, lost these circles with friends of mine that profess revelations where they really feel like it's all coming true again in revelations you have such generic cautions to society based on most likely things that have happened before revelations was written that they'll always be true there'll always be evil people tyrannical people globalists trying to take away all the control to put it underneath a few banker families royal families or what have you that's always going to be the case and so some things like revelations will always seem real. So there's always going to be someone trying to unify currencies. There's going to be someone trying to tag you with the symbol of the beast, which could be literal, could be simply the tag you get on your hand when you try to leave an amusement park so you can get free admission back in. Go to a nightclub. They mark your hand. And, you know, they'll say like, oh, I can't mark your left hand. It's got to be your right hand. You know, because that there's some level of uh, authenticity if you find, the bartender finds the you can drink over 21 symbol on your left hand. Like, really? It's, it's not, it's hardly like some triple DS encryption going on there. Dr. Stephen Greer, who's made the couple movies, uh, one's called Unacknowledged, I think the other one is, what is it, like Serious Project, where he has the little potentially human embryo, or excuse me, human infant that was um, obviously brought into this world way too soon and it was preserved in a towel by a monk in South America then rediscovered the towel most likely was able to 
wrap the, the fetus in such a tight wrap that it, it made the skull different and because the skull is pretty much cartilage until it dries out. You know, it's not quite technically like that, but the bones are pliable in the infancy stage and it hardens as you get older, which is why a kid's head's kind of soft when it's born, right? The, the three plates that union with a cartilage seam, you know, and the cartilage seam fades away and the soft spot fills in and you have a normal adult skull. But 2001, right in the year of 9-11, just prior to 9-11, as I understand it, he came out with the, you know, the Disclosure Project, which is to aggregate a bunch of military and government folks that have had top clearance at times to discuss their sightings and all of these sort of black projects that were around the uh, UFO phenomenon. And we have to acknowledge that, you know, leaders throughout time have all acknowledged that this does happen. There are unidentified flying objects in the sky. Prince Philip has been noted as saying definitely real, uh, I believe, Churchill and Truman and um, Eisenhower. And, you know, a lot of folks have come out and said that this stuff is real. The former leaders of various intelligence agencies and military generals have all said, yeah, it's something we're dealing with. But now... What's interesting about a lot of their admissions is that they they will all kind of agree at a table that there are these things that exist in space or in our immediate, you know, blue sky that are unidentified. But what you don't hear is a lot of quotes about the actual ET creatures until you go below those folks into the sort of individuals that have been dealing with Wright-Patterson Air Force Base stuff, et cetera, et cetera. And there's plenty of these testimonies and these deathbed confessions that are starting to come out on the internet. And if you watch them closely and dissect everything that they're saying, there's a tremendous amount of sort of frog DNA is what I call it. You know, Jurassic Park, when they resurrected the dinosaur, they didn't have the entire DNA sequence. Again, they had no protein patterns, so you can't just exactly duplicate these things. But they substituted as part of Michael Crichton's original novel frog DNA which allowed the fe uh, male to turn into a female the female to turn into a male I think they were all females right which is ridiculous last thing you want is a uterus to exist if you're trying to keep things from procreating of the interviews I've seen of Stephen Greer's amazing effort the overwhelming majority that I have seen personally are they're kind of like coast-to-coast -coast interviews where you have a gentleman that'll come on coast-to-coast -coast AM radio program, and he'll be telling a tall tale about traveling to different planets, doing time travel, all this other stuff. And their story is pretty airtight up to a point. And then it just dies because they get asked one question that opens up an avenue they haven't thought up. And because they haven't role-played, they don't have the ability to be a dungeon master or a game master and fly by the seat of their pants and make it indistinguishable, like to, to write new fiction that ties in with everything they've said before, opens up a creative narrative, doesn't go too far into specifics, or there's a clever reason why they don't know things. They'll just sort of tank. And then the questions that come in, when the callers, because if you've ever watched, if you haven't, excuse me, if you haven't listened to Coast to Coast AM, he'll, uh, George Nori is currently the host. They'll introduce someone. They will get to ch tell their story, their completely rehearsed story, start to finish. And again, they've done a little bit of due diligence on how to answer questions about what they talked about. And so as a, as a crude example, it would be, you know, someone asking me what I did with my day, and I said, I got up early, and I went down and got breakfast, and I had a meeting in Los Angeles, I battled traffic, which wasn't too bad, did my meeting, then I decided to visit one of my friends there, and then I fought traffic all the way home. And that's my story. And so what I'm hoping you'll do is ask me what I ate for breakfast, you, what was the traffic really like, uh, what was your meeting about, and who did you meet with afterwards, and how was traffic coming home? But someone might call up and say, oh, you said you were in Los Angeles. Yeah, yeah, I was totally in Los Angeles. Say, well, did you take the 405? I did. Well, did you go by, say, Artesia exit? Yeah, I totally did, absolutely. 
they'll say, well, there was a huge factory fire over there and there was a jackknife truck because they're looking at the fire and I heard there was like, you know, a fatality and 50 cars piled up. What was that like? And because these folks on these shows have sort of lied about most of what they're talking about, a lot of them will cave. They'll be unable to say, oh, well, yeah, there was that. And the idea is the caller is calling in with empirical facts about reality, and the person telling the story hasn't really been to Los Angeles that day, so they should have added that to the narrative because that was a groundbreaking situation. It'd be like going to Napa Valley during the fires up there, uh, telling a story that you went up there, and you didn't mention the fact that the whole place is on fire. Right? And so that kind of stuff happens a lot in these death bed confessions where it goes up to a point and they'll start either having holes in their stories or they're missing critical data or they will start citing someone else's story in the middle of their story. It's supposed to be a deathbed confession of their experience. That's what's valuable about a deathbed confession. But speculation about someone else's life, well, let's get them in to do an interview. Now, sometimes the folks that they're referring to have passed away, and so we have a problem there. At that point, we need a story from person A that worked with that individual, and then we need some corroborating story from another person who doesn't know the first person. And so we get sort of different perspectives. That's what happened a lot with the Roswell crash that started to make me believe that despite, you know, the last 10 years of my life really coming to grips with the fact that I think that UFOs were more of a scare tactic of the military industrial complex to the people to make them believe that we have alien technology that I didn't think at the time that we had. When I started really getting into the Roswell thing, and you have to understand this is, this is a classic thing that happens to people from time to time. I went in with the absolute objective in my Roswell episode to debunk it completely and to say this is where it all fell apart this is where the uh, testimonies don't match because there's a uh, there's a corner that has a uh, he personally got a phone call from the military to figure out how to preserve for a pathologist which is a person who's autops autopsies a child size being and he was very curious why they were asking him such a thing. And his response was like, well, depending on how you, the pathologist, well, depending on the objective of the pathologist, there's different ways of preserving a body. But getting it cold is the number one thing. And getting it cold quick if it's decomposing. And so he had a female nurse friend at the hospital that then he tracked down and realized that she was involved with the autopsy of the uh, the bodies that were dead. Now, the narratives that I heard from the eyewitnesses at the Roswell crash said that uh, two were dead, and or one was completely dead, one was about to die, and the other one was pretty much unscathed. The other folks that have talked about it from the military, especially in Stephen Greer's project, added one more body that was dead. And so it could have been inside the vehicle and just not pulled out for people to view. Even the eye test, eyewitness testimonies of the civilians that saw the crash said, we didn't climb inside this vehicle. It was very injured and broken apart at one point, but we didn't go inside. So there could have been more bodies inside. But as I've said, you know, in several episodes, the part that got me, that sort of the clincher was the bridge party that was happening where, I think it's Ramey's that came with all the debris he had shown his son. And, uh, apologize if I got that name wrong, but... He starts showing his fellow military people who are weather balloon experts. And they said, you know, this was definitely real. It had three different types of material and these rulers with this writing on it, which was then transcribed. You can look it up on the Internet and look at potentially, potentially, if they're not lying, you're looking at alien writing, which was later cleansed to say that it was a tape from a toy company in New York. And so when we say, okay, show us the tape, like a real preserved role of this tape, not your memory of this tape, but the real preserved role of this tape and its design, they can't come up with it. But isn't it fascinating that there is no alien crash that I'm aware of that has the infamy and the, the level of, of 
documentation and eyewitnesses of the 1947 Roswell crash. There are soldiers in the Disclosure Project that talk about crashes that they have seen and that they get them getting roughed up again by some foreign agency that showed up in vehicles that seem to have anti-gravity propulsion systems and they're you know interrogated for 14 hours and telling them that uh, they're going to get killed and poking them in the chest with M16s and all kinds of wild stuff. So it would be either that they got a grip on all crashes, right? And they always happen in remote areas of the world. The amount of sightings with all kinds of people that said they saw something in the wilderness and there's a bunch of lights and this kind of thing. Uh, that's, uh, there's a lot of those, but there's nothing like Roswell. Nothing like it at all that I'm aware of, right? There is an incident at Murray Island. I believe that's the way they call it. And I'm going to do an episode on that because I found an amazing video. I was at my smoke shop. And someone uh, created a, I think it was maybe um, Jaronism had created a compilation about the Murray Island thing. And I cannot find it in his library. And I've posted it in his discussion section to help me with the link. With no reply because the guy gets too bombarded by requests. But he had a, a video that tied the Murray Island incident, which I think is off the coast, east coast, around New York area. And it's it, he was linking it all the way into the administration and the Masonic guys and the, the Masons and all kinds of wild, devil-worshipping, weird stuff. And so it was so chaotic that I needed to sit down and watch it, take notes, and kind of figure out where these connections were made. Because the video was started... Uh, before I got in the room, so there was some, there were some connections at the very beginning that I missed, and so I had to figure out why this would be connected to a bunch of weird, fake churches in Brooklyn, New York, and so on and so forth. Maybe it was even the Bronx. The other link to sightings has to do with the fact that, you know, there's been this assertion by the military, and again, it doesn't explain a lot of things, but when we finally split the atom that somehow the you know the forces that be outside this planet said oh you're not allowed to take these into space you're not allowed to mess around because this actually hurts our stuff it's sort of the assertion and you know there there have been interesting sightings around rocket launches where you have what looks to be like a sort of like a white fly it's obviously much bigger than a fly that's flying around these uh, devices and seemingly, you know, zapping them, taking, you know, disarming the nuclear warhead, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There have been claims that these vehicles fly over missile silos and turn them off and deactivate them. Again, they're just words so far. Unfortunately, there's crop circles. Crop cycles seem to be extremely cyclical, right? They come and they go. And then there's uh, obviously universities that go out and do them on purpose. There are artists that go out and create a beautiful crop circles with these amazing geometric shapes, but they're doing it in public eye. Even if they do them in the middle of the night because they don't really own the land and the farmer's going to be a little pissed off that their crop was pushed down. Thank God they don't have to cut it. But they later reveal, yeah, we did this. And so it's like, okay, crop cycles can be made by man and they could be extremely elaborate and gorgeous. Don't have to be aliens. Doesn't mean if an alien did the first one, we couldn't figure out how they did it and, and copy it. Now there's this, there's this technicality for the, the way that supposedly the UFOs do it versus the way that students do it. And students... They get a board and a rope. And the board's about, I don't know, 6 to 10 feet, depending on their desire. And they put a rope down to both sides, and they hold the rope with their two hands, and they put their foot, one foot on the ground, one foot on the, on the board, and then they, they pat down the earth in a particular direction, shape, and vector, and it creates the push-down grass. Now, the technicality I heard of probably in the 90s, late 80s, was that the UFO ones actually uh, um, weave the uh, grass together. 
like a like a braided hair thing and that when humans do it it doesn't work like that i don't know i've never seen a crop circle in my life i think it's also fascinating that they happen to have they happen to either happen in uh, england which is i think where they first started to show up i could be wrong but i think that's what i've always heard and then it happens close to universities in the united states of america and it's kind of an east coast thing um but what's strange is growing up in Kansas with tons of crops like wheat and hay to feed the animals, we have uh, amazing opportunities to have crop cycles uh, sewn into the ground by UFOs, right? And because UFOs typically appear in remote areas, never over, you know, well, I shouldn't say that, but, you know, we haven't had them fly down the the main street of Boston you know we've had them over the capitol building of Washington DC these flying lights which is very strange but you would just think that it would happen in the rural areas as well it'd be a unifying thing it would happen all over the world and not just in certain areas just a hunch right you also have the the hoaxsters the tricksters and they I know absolutely positively frustrate the, the UFO community that is looking for the real deal. And the, the sort of telltale sign about a hoaxer is that you will have videos that emerge on the internet quite often where you have a whole group of people looking at supposedly a UFO. It's something flying in the air. There's one over Wright-Patterson Air Force Base the middle of last year, which is sort of this flying wing that was very interesting. Husband and wife. Now, this one was corroborated by supposedly someone with a 35mm camera in a different area, but it was a broad daylight sighting. But you have a husband and wife kicking off the real video uh, of this thing. And, of course, the husband's camera doesn't work on his cell phone. Okay, every cell phone has two cameras, right? You could figure out a way to get it to work somehow. When you're seeing the most amazing thing on planet Earth, would you really sit next to it with your recording device and go, oh, do you got, do you got this? Okay, I won't get my camera out then since you're filming it. It's, you know, it's Jesus Christ coming back from the dead. And, if you, and as long as you're filming it, I'm cool with not filming it. Really, right? Over the last 15 years, we've had uh, a new emergence of uh, computer-generated UFO sightings where you have uh, students at colleges that are going to school for special effects. And, of course, they want to have a very creative project to, you know, to show their students, show the teachers, get good grades. And, obviously, when you create a project to master a skill, well, let me tell you the secret. The secret is, is that it's more interesting if you have an interesting project. So if you're trying to fake something that's been faked a hundred times, eh, whatever. But hey, man, you're gonna you're gonna create a UFO phenomenon. You maybe you don't even start it off to deceive anyone. You just create it. You're doing all kinds of motion track, tracking, cool stuff, and then all of a sudden you realize that people see it and start to freak out over it and think it's real, and then you go with it. And then we have sort of a UFO thing that doesn't have to do with something flying in the air. We have artwork and artifacts that seem to point towards someone else participating in the, in the creation of the earth. You have um, cave art and art on the side of rocks in South America. Uh, the cave art's, you know, everywhere. And they seem to have the ability to render themselves pretty good. And so when you look at all the stick figures that are the people... And some of them are very elaborate, you know, they're hunting and hunting, you know, wild animals. And you see sort of, again, the ecosystem of their world. And then all of a sudden you see them draw a character that's much taller and has bizarre limbs and sort of looks like, I don't know, sort of some hybrid of a, of a gray alien, as it might be said, some more sort of almond-eyed things. There are wooden artifacts of sort of these serpent type creatures so you take sort of a lizard and you take a gray alien and you put them together david ike has his shaman in south africa that has these artifacts where a male render it's like a wood male rendering of an alien with almond eyes impregnating a female 
who has been carefully rendered as a human. So when you're looking at their craft, you're not looking at a mistake and someone's saying, oh, well, they probably just couldn't do eyes very well. No, you look at the other one in the same, made in the same time frame, and they seem to have humans down really, really well. So if they intentionally made a serpent creature, they're doing it intentionally. It could be someone eating peyote and having a wild experience. It could be some mythos that has been handed down that is their God belief, you know. Uh, again, we talk about every once in a while on the show the Egyptians that have gods that are sort of, uh, you know, they have heads of various beasts like um, anteaters and hawks and all kinds of stuff. Blue skin, regular skin, black skin, olive skin. No one would ever accuse the artists of Egypt as being incapable of rendering something perfect when they have, you know, giant statues of their pharaohs beautifully rendered. You know, faces that are uh, several meters wide and tall that are perfect, perfectly rendered, super hard granite. We have artifacts in paintings. You know, uh, I believe the Mona Lisa has a little one, but there's all kinds of Middle Ages sort of paintings and renderings that have what appears to be flying craft in the uh, air in the background in the sky okay so they can render a human being photo real but they they're somehow getting this other thing wrong symbolically what's interesting about finding out that our space agencies have lied about a tremendous portion of what they've accomplished is that when you go back and then reevaluate all of the entities in space that they say they have a complete grasp over then you start to go, well, maybe this is all fake. A comet is a very interesting thing. Uh, Halley's Comet, which I was actually privileged to see. I saw Halley's in Hellbop. But as a kid in the mid-80s, I saw Halley's Comet come by. And, you know, what is the, what is the misconception about a comet? And, and ironically, my high school mascot was a comet. The tail always goes away from the sun. And from the world of ethereal particles that I profess, it makes complete sense. The sun is a huge emitting force. And if you have something that's pliable like a ball of snow and, and soot, it's going to push off part of the veneer in, a, in that particular direction. But what is the story of Halley's Comet? Because a friend of mine who's not super deep into astronomy asked me a really fundamental question. And he said... How could this thing keep coming back every 75 years, and God knows where it goes after that, and not simply burn away at some point? How does it always have fuel on it to create a tail? Forget the physics of where it's going and what have you. How is it able to do this? Wouldn't it eventually evaporate? Now, it may simply be the, the attrition of it's a big, it was a gigantic ball at one point, and it's just frying away. But what if it wasn't a comet? What if it was something else? The idea that it would be a, a UFO and have a tail is sort of weird, right? There were some, uh, some sort of, I guess you would call them amateur astronomers that were pretty serious in, in England that had a press conference once and they were taking all of the photographs of the sun that were pulled in from various agencies and every single digital anomaly on the shots they said were mother ships and stuff. And you're talking about ships that would be almost the size of a, of a small moon. It was just sort of ridiculous. But they weren't moon shaped. They were like, you know, aircraft carrier shapes. But it was just a digital anomaly most likely in the photograph. Who knows? They just didn't seem to have an organic signature. It seemed to have a blemish in the photograph if you know anything about interpreting uh, digital imagery. Okay. But then my friend asked me a very interesting question because the International Space Station, the ISS, which a lot of us believe is largely potentially faked because of all the weird, you know, cables and stuff that we see. Go see my episode on the ISS to see actual examples of, these, of this footage. If you guys are coming in off audio, you want to hit YouTube at some point. But, you know, when I was in high school... Uh, my teacher told me in astronomy, he said, look, and this was repeated in college, that when they take a, a really high-powered telescope and they film the atmosphere, 
and they calculate how much of the sort of view rectangle that they're looking at has a certain level of circumference of the earth, right, accounted for, that when they see the constant bombardment of rocks and debris from space, which is, again, is supposed to be a vacuum, the average calculation of a permanent collision with outer foreign bodies was 100 million foreign objects hit the atmosphere of Earth per minute. You could half that and you're still, your mind should be a little bit blown, all right? So when you think about a bunch of satellites in space and ISS space station out there, uh, the Hubble telescope that's got a, you know, a precise spy satellite lens looking deep into space, which is really the, the Project Aurora NS747, or is it Aurora or is it, uh, no, sorry, it's uh, Sophie, Sophia, excuse me, got that wrong. You start to ask the question, if you've ever seen the movie um, Gravity with Sandra Bullock, you start to see this notion of how could that be up there without getting hit routinely by at least one or two rocks a day. If you have a hundred million out there, now some of you might say, well, it's the Van Allen belts that completely protect. All right, but... I'm willing to bet at least a baseball size thing is going to make it through the Van Allen belts every once in a while as we see shooting stars up there, or falling stars. This space station would be ripped apart by at least one or two of these things. There'd at least be a single incident where a piece of debris went through one of these vessels at 35,000 miles an hour, roughly. And, you know, when you're hit by something that quickly, there's a couple of things that can happen. One, it punches an absolute pure hole through the device. But if there's any resistance as a structural integrity issue, you know, what if a, um, a single meteorite came in and went lengthwise down the ISS, down one of the big tubes, and it's, it's hitting the wall? And so it's just literally like the bullet that shot through the apple or the bullet that shot through the Coke bottle. It is tearing a hole in a split fraction of a millisecond, tearing it apart. All the bodies inside, well, they're going to get torn apart most likely. Even just the, the concussive wave of, of force is going to probably invert human bodies, just the shock wave of it. You know, one of the things I was told a long time ago was that uh, when you shoot animals with guns, you do have various regions of the body that you will shoot them and it penetrates the body and they will bleed out, the hemorrhage, and they die. But if you shoot, for instance, there was a gentleman who had shot a bear to death with a 357 Magnum and he emptied the gun into the skull of the bear and the bear died. Big, giant grizzly bear. And the... I guess the taxidermist or the scientist that looked at this bear afterwards said, you know what, the bullets barely penetrated the skull of the bear. And it didn't look to be a fatal wound. But what it did look like was that the shock wave of the bullet bouncing off the skull most likely traumatized the brain cavity so badly that it probably had its nervous system paused enough that it actually lost consciousness and died. Sort of like the venom in a... Uh, Black Mamba, as I've heard it described, it really just pauses the immune system, or sorry, the electrical system in the human body from a tox toxic shock standpoint, and you die of it. But he went on to ask me, he goes, how do they predict meteor showers? And immediately my brain goes, well, these things are cyclical, and we have watched them in the past, and we figured out their cycles, and da 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 and then I started to think, well, that's an interesting story that I was told as a kid. But honestly, we're talking about essentially invisible clouds of mass, you know, of whatever it is, iron rocks or whatever it is, that because we're never in the same spot in the galaxy from any moment in time, you know, we are rotating. We are, I mean, again, heliocentric standard um, models. Again, you want to use their, if you're a flat earther, just use their science against them. And everything is 666, right? We're spinning at a 666 rate. We're going around the sun at a 666 rate. The sun is spinning through the, uh, the galaxy. So we shouldn't be in any physical location that would create these cyclical uh, predictions. But 
What's interesting is, having gone out and looked at them several times, especially as a young man in the 80s, they happen on the nights that they say. So either it is just that easy, which it might be, or there's some other reality to where we are, that maybe it's some anomaly that's happening as a defect of our reality, and it's like, hey, yeah, this is, uh, these are meteorites. Yes, absolutely. And remember, you've never seen a meteorite ever go up from the line of sight in front of you. You always see it go down. And in a heliocentric ball, you would most definitely see them go up just as much as you'd see them go down. And, you know, they do go left and right, but they're always on a downward vector. I've seen them several times, and I've seen a couple really good ones on this block in the last 12 months. And a lot of other people saw it, and they're like, oh, my God, did you see that? You know, it's like a big diagonal down. The big ones that landed over Russia, they're going down. There was the one that happened in 2018. Somebody supposedly filmed a meteorite hitting the ground, and, and people say it's an energy weapon. Because we've had very selective, bizarre forest fires and house fires in Santa Ana and uh, in Calistoga up north. So the back on subject here, our UFO sightings appear to have attention put on them in these cycles. And it seemed that when we were in the, the sort of baby boomer era, we just gotten out of World War II, the sightings went off the charts, which is, and it really blew up after the Roswell crash. And so a lot of psychologists will say, look, it's because it was introduced into the lexicon of man. And that may be true. But now let me, um, let me throw something at you here. Douglas Adams, the author of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, in his last two books, which were reprised by Dirk Maggs of the BBC, who I had the privilege of, uh, working with, uh, in some light capacities, I hired one of the sound engineers to work for my game company, Paul Weir. Super talented people. He, uh, well, when they reprised the, the second two books, which was uh, about 20 years after the originals were created for the BBC, which is the way to, when you want to hear that story, you want to hear the BBC recordings uh, and not the, uh, the books, because the books are all uh, messed up in terms of timeline. But anyway... There's a scene where they hid the, I believe it's the um, Starship Heart of Gold, or at least one of the vehicles outside of a soccer match, and, or football match, as they call it over there. And so you have, uh, I believe Arthur Den is there, and I think it's Ford Prefect coming to pick him up. And he said, you know, let's go, let's go. And he says, oh, you know, I'm done with this whole thing. I, you know, the first two books got me, right, technically. And eventually he agrees to go with him. And he says, well, where's your spaceship? And he goes, it's right over there. And Arthur Dent looks over there, and I believe I got the characters correct. And he goes, uh, well, how can you park a spaceship right next to everybody? And he goes, well, because they don't believe they can see it. They don't believe that it exists, so I can park it right there in plain sight. And they don't see it. And Arthur Dent's like, oh, my God. And so I think there's even a, com a little couple lines of comedy where he's walking around going, can't you see this? Can't you see this? And no one sees it. They get in the ship and they leave. How many times have you had a word that you learn? And as soon as you learn the word, you hear it all the time. And you're like, my God, was this some thing that went on the national news? Hey, there's a new word, everyone. Use it. And this is how you use it in a sentence. And everyone starts using that word. No, it's that you finally had that opened up in your mind and now you hear it and now you use it what if ufos are merely visible when something irreconcilable happens a crash a roswell crash happens the military air force newspaper in roswell new mexico reports it on the, like, the seventh page or something Flying saucer crashed, alien bodies recovered, da da da, and then the world suddenly has it translated into their mechanisms of understanding, which is a newspaper. And now the world looks up and the world goes, Holy shit, they're everywhere. But because the military comes in and says, nah, No, 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 it's just a weather balloon trying to uh, uh, sense, you know, what is it, nuclear bomb tests in Russia. 
which on its face is kind of silly, right? Okay, so you you discovered that a, a bomb was detonated in Russia and you got these waves coming through the atmosphere and then suppose you can kind of calculate the magnitude of the um, mushroom cloud and that kind of thing. Eh, I guess that, that has some value and that's, I guess, the only way you can do it. It's really strange because the U-2 did not exist to conduct surveillance overhead, right? So then it opens up the mind. People can see it just by having it hurt. Again, I'm just riffing here. What if that's the case? Hollywood swoops in and says, no, 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 no. Don't look up. Look over here. Come to the silver screen. Get yourself some popcorn, something to drink. Sit down and we will totally marry the two concepts together. Day the Earth is still, Forbidden Planet, Star Trek, and a million other little B-movies that were made back in the day. And we will take over the narrative of what they could be. And they're always going to be humanoid uh, beings. And you don't need to worry. Don't envision them as being gray aliens or anything like that. I'm not sure where the gray alien thing came about. I seem to believe, you know, one of the first episodes of Star Trek has the sort of big veiny testicle head guy, right? who communicates through tele, uh, telepathic communication. And I think they even had telekinesis in this. But it starts to take it down to our level and make it silly. And then we no longer want to, or, or maybe we're not capable of resonating to just the generic theory that there's things in space. But, you know, I will fall back to my grandmother's viewing to say, at, 12, at 8 to 12 years old, when she said she started seeing these things with her sister, I don't think that in the 20s, okay, she's born in 1912, so by 1920, you didn't have Buck Rogers stuff. She was in the Midwest with no money. You know, She wasn't seeing all of that input. So whatever, saw, whatever she saw, she saw. Another friend of mine said that his father was a test pilot. I mentioned this once before as well. He was flying, and uh, he eventually got injured in a, in a test flight and could no longer fly as a test pilot. He ended up flying for celebrities all over Japan and flew Bob Hope around to the, the, uh, the uh, USO. But before his career was over as a test pilot, he said he was up really, really high, and which I probably at the time was maybe 40,000 feet or so. And he said this disc that was at least 20 meters across, which is, you know, 60 feet, flew right up to his, his uh, craft. And it had like a pulsing disco-like kind of thing around the outer rim. And it got so close to him that he was terrified it was going to kill him just by hitting him uh, or making him trying to do an evasive maneuver, which at that height for the particular vehicle he was flying, which we have no idea what it was, that, you know, he would just disintegrate up there. Not supposed to make big, fast, right turns in an SR-71, right? And he held that story until his deathbed, literally. And because he didn't want his, his relatives to know. Because, he, you know, it's part of, like, being nuts or it's scary. Now, a lot of guys uh, have, for the Roswell crash, uh, there's countless stories of the individuals that participated in that and who actually saw the aliens because they had no, again, uh, precursors from fictional things in their mind when they really saw, I mean, I'm just going with their story, when they really said they saw these alien bodies, it freaked them completely out. And the unifying word that went across several of these individuals was creatures and terrifying and scary. That could have been their interpretation of what they saw. Again, without really communicating with them as those individuals. Okay, so let's say that let's say that the story of the surviving Roswell member of him dying in 1952, which I recently saw reaffirmed. I believe it was an interview in the Disclosure Project. Let's say that guy continued existing. But a lot of these folks didn't have additional access after the first eyewitness situation. Now, there's all these stories about Truman and Area 51 and Eisenhower and Area 51 and Carter and all these individuals trying to get in and see this stuff. And 
because the presidents of the United States are considered temporary employees. They are sort of on an intelligence level on a need-to-know basis. And so they can't get raw access to this data. We have to filter all this stuff. So the question at the end of this episode that I want to pose is the following. Uh, prior to Stephen Greer's disclosure project, when I had my own little encounter, which I'm going to give you again, because it's been dozens and dozens of episodes back, it, uh, well, let me just tell you my experience. And again, to this day, I'm a little miffed at what happened. There is an explanation that could explain the whole thing. I was reading, I was living with a girlfriend in Oxnard, California in a beach house. It was like three houses back from the sand. And I had been at the bookstore and I was buying probably some techie book or something. And I looked down in the bargain bin next to the front. I think it was a B. Dalton's book. And I see the cover of Whitley Strieber's book, Communion. Before I go on, I think Whitley Strieber is largely 99% embellished I think maybe he had a real experience at one point, and then, like so many folks, they want more, and so they create them fictionally. He could be telling the truth, but he seems to have every experience that everyone else has. So if you were to go up to him and say, oh my gosh, you know, I had a uh, a great alien pour me a Coke in the kitchen, he'll say, oh, me too, and he tells a whole story about how he is. So he seems to usurp everyone else's experiences in his books, but whatever. But I see the cover of this book. And there's this Luke, I'm your father moment for me, which is that every time I've seen that big veiny head thing and a big giant skull alien almond eyed thing in all the 70s specials and, you know, where they're talking about aliens and stuff, my gut, my gut had this horrible feeling of that is wrong, even as a child. And it bothered me. And when I saw the more flat, thin head creature on the front of this book, My brain just had angels sing, and it was like, I don't know what that book is, but I'm going to buy it because someone finally rendered them the way that they look, which is a beige gray, which is a female. Pick up the book. I have no idea what it's about. I know Whitley Strieber from uh, Cat's Eye, the movie, only because my father obsessed on the movie, but I didn't realize at the point that he had written this book. And I take it home, and I start reading it to my girlfriend at night. We took turns, right? which means I read it 80% of the time. On uh, probably the last 30 pages of the book, it starts getting a little spooky, where he starts talking about missing time, where he would kind of be going home from work, and then all of a sudden it was daytime, then it was nighttime, and one second later, and he realized he lost two hours or 30 minutes, and then this alien kind of started tracking on him and stuff. So it was the last pages that we read before this event occurred. I go to bed that night. It was near Christmas time. And there's a power amplifier that I have for some musical instruments down in front of me. And I I wake up sitting on this amplifier, which was our Christmas tree. And we don't have a lot of gifts between the two of us. And I I believe I had seen the gifts. I'm not one that tries to figure out what things are. I think that's kind of shitty. But my girlfriend at the time, because my birthday's in August, had gifted me uh, for my birthday some big LPs and custom 12 inch LPs of Prince because she was from Queens, New York. And so she went back to New York, went to some really cool vinyl stores and brought me these albums. And we still bought albums at the time, but it was kind of fading out. This is about 1990. And uh, so I wake up in my beach house. I'm sitting on this thing. I'm sitting in my underwear and I'm looking straight at this gray alien who's the same height as me, a little bit taller. His eyeballs are about dead on with me. And I look over, and my kitchen table was built by my girlfriend and I. It was one of those do-it-yourself things where you can varnish it. It's kind of an old country table. And on there, we had um, a puzzle. And over by the puzzle, there's these little guys, like the ones in front of me, and they're we're moving super-duper fast. It's, it's like they're either looking at the puzzle or they're building it or something. Of course, we didn't wake up with it built, but they're over there. And then every once in a while on a cycle, this little guy would go zip around the room. And the guy in front of me goes, uh, it seemed like it was a male. And again, I can't really say I saw his mouth move. But 
from all the dream stuff I've told you about us not having our bodies, this was a touch, touchy-feely vision. It was not like the average dream where you're sitting there and you don't feel your body. I felt my body very distinctly, okay? He, he says, uh, are you going to be okay? And I'm kind of groggy. It's like you're waking up out of medication, right? And I said, I guess. And I said, no, I said, uh, sorry, that's the second line I said. He goes, are you going to be okay? And I said, well, no one's going to believe me. And when he said, are you going to be okay? He put his little hand on my shoulder. And it was his right arm on my left shoulder. And I could feel it touch me very distinctly, okay? And I said, well, no one's going to believe me. And he, and, uh, he goes, well, what would make them believe you? And I said, I don't know. I'm like in this kind of pissy, melancholy mode. He reaches down between my legs and he pulls up a present. And he goes, if I told you what was in this present, would they believe you? And I said, I guess. But I'm staring at a flat, square present. And I know that's an album because that's what she gets me. She got me several. And we, and, and it was like, it wasn't just Christmas that she would do this. She'd get me one because one came out, you know, here's another album. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. So I close my eyes. Oh, sorry. He tells me what it is. He goes, this is origami paper. Okay. In my brain at the time, I had never seen origami paper in my life. And I would think origami paper B by 11. And so I just, I know almost nothing about it. And so I close my eyes and I wake up on the side of my bed. The clock is one, two, zero, zero. And it's one of those moments where you don't have any other visions. You don't have any other dreams. You just close your eyes and you wake up. And I've had that happen maybe three or four times in my entire lifetime where I lay down in the bed, close my eyes, wake up and I'm, boom, it's the morning. I can hear her cleaning up stuff out front in the kitchen. So I go out my underwear, I go around, I sit down in front of this thing and Without saying anything to her, I touched the present. It's right there in front of me, and it's soft. And I looked at her, and I said, Well, you won't believe this, but I just dreamed that an alien told me what, what was in this present. Being extremely confident that I cannot guess something I've never seen before, she smiles, and she's cleaning out a pan, and, and she goes, Oh, yeah? I said, Yeah. I said, He told me this is origami paper. And she just stops. And her only comment was, well, he better not have told you what was in your big gift. And I'm sitting there going, don't you think this is a little strange that I figured out what this was and I, I never seen it? Later I asked her, I said, why did you get me origami paper? And she said, because you love the movie Blade Runner and you made a comment that you'd wanna, you would love to learn how to do what Gaff does, which is fold all these things up. And so the explanation, the scientific explanation might be that her and I were in a very small twin bed. And so we were back to back as adults because we hadn't bought our queen bed yet. So we just moved in together. And then maybe just having our heads close together, which is a lot of scientific proof that this happens. I simply read her mind and I integrated the book as the narrative of the mechanism. So it's sort of up there as a weird thing. I contacted her 10 years after, as I've said before, and I said, well, didn't you think that was weird? She goes, I just thought you read my mind. I was like, okay, probably did. But back then, I thought maybe the reason why, because before I'd interpreted the idea that I could have read her mind, that, that did not occur to me until much later. I thought, well, maybe it's because I was reading this book and the book was updating my frequency to aliens, right? To these grays or whatever, right? Which, according to Stephen's group, is just one of many species that have come to Earth. And uh, he then said in his uh, serious movie, I believe I got the name of that right, that that's what he does. He takes people out and they all think about seeing the aliens and then they start seeing them and then they can film them. It's like they know where to point the camera. And he has all kinds of footage of seeing these lights come up and down. Even Whitley Strieber says if you go visit him in upstate New York, he'll definitely get you a visitation. But it's never what Whitley uh, experiences, which is like full abduction. So what if it is a matter of opening our minds because we have this injected into our minds. Then the regimen to open up the communications is exactly what Stephen Greer is talking about. We have to lay to the side the fictional narratives of Hollywood, and we have to sit and develop really basic acknowledgement of their existence, and really nothing more. Nothing more. 
just understand that there's probably more life out there wherever we are. For those of you who believe in flat earth, think of it as your dome owners. And that they're simply slipping in through some door, they show up, they have their thing. Hey, they're not perfect, so an electrical storm or some anomaly inside, maybe they're fighting over the controls or the ham sandwich that's in there and it blows up and it hits the ground. For whatever reason, they do crash every once in a while. And when the crash happened, just so lucked out it was in Roswell, New Mexico, or just outside of Roswell, New Mexico, and they managed to make contact with Americans. But according to other foreign governments, they've also made contact as well. As Stephen Greer said in his uh, unacknowledged uh, special on Netflix, which I recommend you see, I don't believe with everything, and unfortunately for him, John Podesta, I believe, closes the credits in this mumbling, rambling session at the end. Well, will he regret that in six months or so? But maybe it is that we have to just simply start thinking about the fact that uh, we're not all by ourselves. And maybe we'll start to see things we didn't see. So I'm curious about your research into UFOs and whether or not you think that there's a cycle, because I seriously, seriously need your knowledge, your more intimate knowledge in UFOs to know whether or not you believe, and just take it decade to decade, right? And let me know if you think if we have surges in visual sightings. And I want you to keep in mind, as if you do think there is a cycle, okay, keep in mind the Hollywood machine, which is both film and television. Um, you could throw books in before that because that would be a methodology and radio, right? You had the the um, War of the Worlds by each uh, by um, sorry Orson Welles and his group uh, that exacerbated panic. And what's interesting about the Orson Welles War of the Worlds is that you have no visual confirmation of what's going on. And he, but the panic is, I guess, in New York City, the, the public started to panic because somehow they had enough information in their mind to see something that wasn't there and panic. I think that's fascinating. Uh, and I, I was going to mention before closing the Ezekiel passages in the Bible, where there's another place that people go. Uh, you have uh, hieroglyphs in Egypt. And I believe even in Sumerian, uh, well, actually Sumerian stuff is not really iconic, but at least in the Egyptian stuff that you have unexplained symbols in sort of the sky versions of various illustrations, right? You have, uh, as I've said in many episodes, cultures that believe that they are from space. Zulu supposedly means people from space. I've only heard that from David Icke and his little shaman guy, but, you know, if that's true, that's interesting. You have the... The Mayan uh, illustrations, which look like guys inside spaceships, you know. So, I don't know when man would first start to hypothesize that that there is some place to be in space. Seeing the moon is very interesting to think that it looks like land in space. And maybe there's someone on that land in space, just like they're down the street. You know, if you could look into the ocean and see an island and then you find out there's people there or that you can go there and live there, then you might start to think, okay, we can be wherever we can stand. And we don't know there's atmosphere and all this other stuff from a long time ago. So we start envisioning that maybe when you look into the blackness of night with these little sparkling stars, the idea that man would turn that into some sort of solar system with with planets out there, it seems almost inconceivable that would be the next thought that man would have without empirical information that that was the case. Uh, Graham Hancock, which studies the pyramids to a level that nobody has ever studied the pyramids, you have this interesting uh, due north placement on the ground, this absolute precision in the actual Great Pyramid, and then you have, if you take the measurements of the pyramid, you start to with a divisible divisibility by 72, you start to get the circumference of the earth, the, I think it's the diameter of the earth, and their symbols for month and year, 
look to be orbital patterns around the sun and a moon. And so it does seem that the Egyptians had full knowledge of space and full knowledge of a life out there. Um, so I don't know. Maybe we had it all at one point and now we don't have it anymore. Why the Egyptians wouldn't render the actual alien beings, well, maybe those, uh, those gods of theirs were those folks. I think you feel me. I wanted to kind of pierce this because it's been on my mind. I've seen a lot of alien stuff recently. Again, the cycle, I think, is returning because prosperity is returning, and that's where we kind of get to relax and see more. You know, If you dig the show, please go to deepthoughtsradio.com. Audio and video links are up there. Patreon's up there. That's all I'm going to say. Take care of yourself and someone else. Thanks for joining, and I'll see you in the next episode. Over now. Oh, 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 oh,